most welcome. Yeah. Okay. Welcome back to session two of our international web conference on literary studies in the coronavirus terrain, reading peril, environment, and normalcy. We have with us a resource person who has joined us from the US, Dr. Christopher Scott. I call upon Dr. Nilakshi Vaze, uh, Nilakshi Madam from Vaze College to, she is the head of the Department of English to introduce Dr. Scott. Nilakshi ma'am, please. Good morning, Dr. Scott. Christopher good morning. Scott. Good morning. Christopher Scott is a lecturer of English, rhetoric and composition at Utah Valley University. It is there that he teaches academic writing, literature and film. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. Professor Scott's research interests lie in supernatural horror fiction and film, rhetorical criticism, and narrative representations of theological iconography and the natural environment. Christopher Scott has served as a judge for the Global Undergraduate Awards Dublin, Ireland, and he's also a co-director of the Gothic Bible Project, an interdisciplinary research group based at the University of Sheffield and in partnership with the University of Auckland. Many of you might be knowing that uh, Dr. Scott has moved from the UK to the USA recently, am I correct? Yes, that is correct. Yeah. Yes. He currently serves as the representative for all lecturers in the Department of English and Literature at the Utah Valley University. Christopher is also a member of Utah Valley University's scholarly and creative undergraduate learning partnership team, which is in short called SCULPT, that's a nice acronym, which uh, supervises the undergraduate research and creative projects. Over to you now. Christopher. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. And thank you uh, to the conference organizers for having me. Um, this, like I said uh, before, when we were talking, uh, uh, before we started this uh, webinar, uh, this is the first time I've ever participated in a conference um, through, through a medium such as this in, in, in kind of an all online environment. So this is something that I'm uh, definitely looking forward to. Um, uh, in participating with you all today. So thank you for having me. Uh, this is an interesting time we live in. And uh, especially now with the, the theme or the topic of this, of this conference, looking at, uh, you know, peril in, in kind of in these times and, you know, with, with COVID-19. And this is, this has become very personal to, uh, for me uh, recently because uh, I just learned uh, three days ago that my father tested positive uh, for COVID-19. So um, he's, he's at, fortunately, he's doing well, and uh, it, it's, it's not affecting him as badly as it has other people. So uh, when I say it becomes personal, it's actually hit quite close to home for me um, when a member of, of, uh, of one's family actually comes down with, with an illness such as this. So um, yeah, so looking at these narratives, these super, supernatural horror narratives, uh, we see almost this interaction with the natural environment. And it's, and it's occurring in a way where the physical environment itself almost becomes a character or almost uh, in a way becomes an agent and, and reacts against uh, any uh, human intruders or any, any any human characters who enter into that troubled space. Um, and so that's, that's really what I'll be looking at uh, to today in this uh, presentation. So I guess you can say that my introduction to troubled spaces occurred quite literally in my life. I grew up in an average sized town in Southern California. I played sports in high school. Um, and after practice, my friends and I we would, we would go to the beach and surf because we lived about five minutes or our school was about five minutes away from the beach. So we would go surf 
after a practice. And that was, that was quite commonplace for us. In, in California, you can drive at 16 years of age. Uh, so most of us had cars and we were able to, uh, to drive to and from school. So getting to the beach wasn't, uh, wasn't difficult for us. Um, it was on one of these days at the local beach. Uh, I'll never forget, even to this day. And while in the water, I was uh, getting ready to surf and I noticed uh, a dark shadow in the corner of my eye. So turning my head uh, and searching for what I thought I saw, I caught a glimpse of it again, uh, fluttering beneath the surface at a size of, it was about four feet, four feet long. Um, this just, this dark, mass or this cloud, uh, this dark cloud under the water just moving and moving toward me. Um, contrasting this with a white sea foam, uh, this form hovered beneath the surface and within about two arms length from me just kept coming closer and closer. Uh, without anybody around, I, I froze. Um, as the dark shape, you know, weaved toward and away from me, my mind raced and, you know, thanks to Steven Spielberg's film Jaws, uh, I, of course I feared the worst. Um, but this thing beside me had no dorsal fin uh, above the water, so di it didn't look like uh, Jaws did in Spielberg's film. Uh, so it must have been some kind of monster, I thought. Uh, when I realized that the mysterious silhouette uh, wouldn't depart and it was continuing to approach slowly, I swam, I leaped, I raced out of the water, um, and out of breath and full of terror, I, I just I shot a quick glance behind me. And uh, there it was in the same place uh, that I originally found it. Um, while trying to, I was trying to warn my friends um, who were out at different places in the water, the shadow glided stealthily until it disappeared uh, into deeper waters, never to be seen again. Seals, seals uh, uh, or sea lions, they frequent Southern California shores, uh, but none behave like that. Uh, to this day, my rational side wants to uh, close the case uh, as an encounter with a harmless uh, sand shark. But thanks to writers such as H.P. Lovecraft and Stephen King, who knows what it could have been, really. <laughs> All I know is that I was frightened and, uh, and utterly vulnerable within a troubled space. So when the natural environment, be it flora or fauna, embodies a source of terror or horror, what we are experiencing, David Del Principe uh, states, is the eco-Gothic at work. He also defines the eco-Gothic as taking a non-anthropocentric position to observe how the environment, species, and non-humans establish this fear. Does the eco-Gothic exist in fictional narratives? Of course it does, and it bears a rich history reaching back to the first great work of literature in Western Eurasian civilization, the Epic of Gilgamesh. In this epic poem, uh, the, tit the titular uh, protagonist finds conflict with a forest which Robert Pogue Harrison identifies as Gilgamesh's first official antagonist. But since the publication of Mary Shelley's canonical Gothic novel, Frankenstein, the literary Gothic mode has portrayed narratives that engage with the human nature dichotomy. Such critics as Lisa Kroger, Catherine Lenone, and Tom J. Hillard have contributed recent scholarly investigations that evince uh, environmental catastrophe and terrific constructions of wilderness in Gothic literature. Though they reveal an environmental discourse within Gothic fiction, their readings limit themselves to these texts, uh, either from the 18th and 19th centuries or late 20th century horror films. Early 20th century literature, uh, classic horror films um, and animation exhibit a unique representation of modern society's amb ambivalent relationship with the natural world. And hitherto overlooked supernatural horror narratives from these media offer a glimpse of this cultural anxiety. One writer in particular, in particular from the early 20th century, Algernon Blackwood, substantiates this mentality in his fiction. Contemporary to Blackwood's works, horror films began a legacy that continues today. When Universal presented its pantheon of creature features, films revolving around titular iconic monsters, one film in particular focused on the physical environment and a monster uh, and a monster which specifically embodied it, Jack Arnold's Creature from the Black Lagoon. In addition to horror films, animation similarly presents peril in the physical environment. Hayao Miyazaki's Princess Mononoke presents a perilous physical setting riddled with gods, demons, and spirits who not only respond to human intruders, but also threaten them with death. By closely analyzing an eclectic selection of multimedia supernatural horror narratives, 
This presentation will highlight how what Hillard refers to as Gothic nature, that is the dreaded return of something from the past into the physical setting of the present, demonstrates hidden, deeply rooted anxieties that surface when humans become haunted by the physical environment in troubled spaces. In 1880, Blackwood's father relocated his family from Crayford to Shortland's house near Bromley, England. Blackwood held a special memory of, his, of this new home for two reasons. His fond holiday memories, which he discusses in one of his publications titled Christmas in England, published in 1890, uh, 1890, and his nocturnal escapades, which he shares in his autobiography, Episodes Before 30. Blackwood would sneak out of his window and stroll through the garden with its variety of plants and flowers. This garden, which Blackwood describes with an aura of religious reverence and piety, provided the physical setting in which he could imagine numerous supernatural inhabitants and conduct his personal religious ceremonies. On some occasions, Blackwood could even, uh, would even bring his older sister. He describes how she, being a lover of mystery, would transform into something pleasantly ethereal in the nighttime garden. With all of the biblical instruction and religious confrontation Blackwood and undoubtedly all his siblings endured, his descriptions of nightly sojourns in the mystical garden with his sister, emphasizing peaceful solitude and childlike innocence, coincidentally reflect a, biblical, uh, a biblically supernatural garden. Blackwood reconstructs these ethereal divine experiences in his fiction by regularly mooring narratives to Edenic and sublime landscapes. In English literature, Eden surfaces in Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen, an allegorical poem about Christian virtues with a network of allusions to various biblical concepts. Eden constitutes one of these concepts and one of Red Cross Knight's varied uh, custodies entail protecting the biblical garden from Satan. Another familiar literary, uh, literary text that explicitly highlights Eden is John Milton's Paradise Lost with its vivid picturesque descriptions. Following a rich literary tradition of Edenic illusion, Blackwood's narrative, The Lost Valley, presents a supernaturally troubled garden as its primary setting. The narrator explain, explains, the moonlight climbed with wings of ghostly radiance that fanned their way into the clefts and pine woods of the Jura all about him. Cool airs of night stirred and whispered, lights twinkled through the, opening, the openings among the trees, and all was scented like a garden, close quote. Anthropomorphizing natural elements, the, the narrator describes a garden seemingly replete with myriad life forms and supernatural sensations within a forested space. The Old Testament similar, similarly describes how God creates Eden, plants Adam therein, and fills it with diverse earthly life. Blackwood's text shares with the biblical account the notion that Eden was not a desolate place. According to Genesis, Adam enjoyed the company of numerous living beings before he received Eve. Blackwood then builds upon this supernatural foundation by presenting the landscape in a sacred context. While venturing deeper into the Edenic Valley, Stephen, the protagonist, senses the supernatural elements he encounters. From a, quote, whirring of voices, close quote, to the purring of trees, Stephen locates the undiscovered corner of the world where the passage of humanity was absent. Blackwood's metaphorical description of Eden portrays an otherworldly, quasi-spiritual landscape uh, characteristic of how Augustine of Hippo describes it in De Civitate Dei, or the city of God. Augustine highlights Edenic existence as one free from such mortal plagues as hunger, fatigue, fear, and death. Observing Blackwood's Edenic description in the light of Augustine's concepts reveals an immortal valley in which its inhabitants find rest. But the idyllic Edenic experience is ephemeral. After the fall in the Bible, God removes Adam and Eve from the garden and renders it undetectable thereafter. Similarly, in Blackwood's story, Stephen enters the figurative Eden until the narrative's allegorical fall thrusts him out and bars re-entry by physically altering the landscape to an unrecognizable state. Stephen concludes the landscape even denied its own existence. Blackwood's aptly titled The Lost Valley then reflects a biblical illustration of Eden along with the latter's eventual disappearance from human possession. 
this loss conjures up the notion of original sin through Adam's fall. And since Eden plays a significant role as the locus from which original sin emerged, Blackwood's focus on Eden shifts to its only, uh, to, sorry, to its only human inhabitants and the foremost consequence of their actions. After thoroughly analyzing Blackwood's figurative representation of Eden, his Adam and Eve personae become more coherent. Blackwood's fictional tales often feature a male and, and female pair as lead characters. And in various cases, this companionship mirrors Christianity's first parents. The Lost Valley particularly follows this model and does so initially through a presentation of the Eve figure. Illustrating Eve prior to Adam recalls the magnum opus of John Scotus Eriogenes De Divisione Naturae, in which he divides the human composition between the internal representing Adam and life and the external representing Eve and temp uh, temptation. Eriogenes' order seemingly observes the biblical presentation of events leading to the fall, since Eve allowed sin to enter her portion of the garden before Adam's. There is, therefore, a literal progression from the external to the internal, from the outer into the inner garden. The Lost Valley follows this de developmental order through its catalytic Eve persona. Trouble in the plot arises when Stephen and his brother become enamored with Katya, a beautiful Eastern girl. The text wastes no time divulging Katya's geographical origins and does so to imply a connection to biblical history. Though the text states that Katya hails from the East, further clarification is necessary because her homeland, modern day Georgia, actually lies in the biblical, sorry, actually lies in the biblically significant Middle East. The Bible describes four rivers branching from Eden and one of these irrigational sources is the Euphrates. Katya's native Georgia occupies a substantial location for the source of the river lies north of the Turkish city Erzurum approximately 150 kilometers southwest of the Georgian border. Edward Robertson, a contemporary of Blackwoods, summarizes the likely sources of Eden and particularly highlights one region in and around present-day Armenia, a small country that borders Georgia. If Eden ever had a place on Earth, Katya's homeland would possess a legitimate claim to that belief. So Katya seemingly represents the troubled space in Blackwood's narrative. Blackwood further emphasizes Katya's connection to physical Eden by positioning her in the story apropos of temptation. Throughout the narrative, Katya tempts Stephen and Mark to the extent that they each, uh, to the extent that each brother succumbs to her influence and willfully risks death. Death as a result of temptation renders unmistakable the biblical interest operating in the story. Stephen ventures into the supernatural atmosphere of the Edenic Valley constantly reminded by the landscape of the fatal consequence of his decision. Stephen later learns that his brother dies first because of Katya's influence. Because the narrator always describes and presents the twins as a single unit, the death of one member while the other survives symbolizes almost Adam's transformative relegation to a mortal state in Eden. In other words, the immortal Adam dies and transfers life to the mortal Adam. Ruth Bienstock and Olick proposes that Eve's fateful sentence lends continued weight and enduring power to the Gothic imagination, haunted by the post-lapsarian awareness. Anolik's an analysis of Eve can be uh, applied to the Lost Valley and specifically Katya's depiction therein. Notwithstanding the emotional pull she exhibits on both Stephen and Mark, Katya neither offers pleasure nor satisfaction in the story. Attached to the Edenic setting, she acts in an antagonistic capacity and constantly reminds the protagonist of death. Adam likewise accepted super, uh, supernal chastisement and death, that is mortality by eating the fruit Eve offers. Stephen and Mark identically respond to Katya's subtle temptation by embracing death. While in contemplation, Stephen declares, quote, for her by God, I'd let myself waste utterly to death, close quote. It is Mark, nonetheless, who ultimately suffers in, uh, in an endemic way in a supernatural landscape for the sake of the woman. Blackwood presents his tale with emphasis on biblical intertext through the Eve persona and supports the representation of the fall emerging from the story's Edenic garden and 
Katya's tempting nature. Blackwood's Adamic prota uh, protagonist in The Lost Valley contends against the temptations of a female character in a struggle that terminates in the male protagonist's figurative or literal death within a troubled space. In the text, Stephen, sharing his forename with Christianity's first martyr after Christ's ascension, objectifies Adamic characteristics commencing at the plot's inception. The text describes Stephen at the prime of his life, age 26 years old. And the narrator, the narrator introduces him, Stephen, uh, as he departs and ventures into the superna uh, supernatural landscape in which he meets the Eve-like Katya. When he meets her, however, an emotional battle erupts within Stephen concerning his agency. Blackwood further troubles the space by planting a forbidden fruit through the guise of choice, reflecting Adam's literal circumstance in Eden. After Adam materializes in the garden, he discovers what he can and should not do. The Lost Valley entrenches this Adamic connection through an Edenic setting in which, in which Stephen interacts with Katya and commits a biblically analogous fall. The text identifies a profound battle that Stephen experiences throughout the plot. Quote, temptation came upon him like a tidal wave that made the mere idea of resistance seem utterly absurd. He remembered wondering with a kind of wild delight whether it could be possible for any human will to withstand such a tempest of pressure, close quote. Utilizing tempestuous metaphors, the narrator seeks to convey the extent of Stephen's internal struggle. And by so doing, the text offers a deeper understanding of the robust temptation originating in Katya and by extension, her surrounding supernatural environment. No other woman in Stephen's lifetime had affected these reactions within him. The text later reveals Stephen understood that to remain with Katya in this otherworldly landscape, he must endure death. Quote, given Stephen and given the particular problem, it was the only way out, close quote. Like Adam, Stephen comprehends what must transpire to continue onward in union with Katya, with Katya, where the frontiers of his being melted, then extended to include her. Stephen would undergo a transition. The frontiers of his being could merely signify an emblematic depiction of the limits of his body and soul and their melting away to include Katya marks figurative reunification, which Genesis can help us clarify. After God forms Eve, Adam declares, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. From the beginning, Adam understands the intimacy of corporeal union that he and Eve must share. The Old Testament also supports this idea when the scriptures divulge the literal occurrence of Adam and Eve's first sexual encounter when, quote, Adam knew Eve his wife, close quote. Stephen similarly exhibits a newfound intimacy with Katya. Blackwood's text explains, he felt he was moving towards someone whom he had known ever since he could remember and who belonged to him as utterly as if from the beginning of time, his possession of her had been absolute. Though Stephen observes Katya for the first time, the narrator divulges visceral sentiments that Stephen experiences in her presence. Milton's Adam similarly expresses his passion for Eve when he encounters her for the first time. Quote, and in her looks, which from that time infused sweetness into my heart unfelt before, and into all things from her air inspired, the spirit of love and amorous delight, close quote. Close quote. Adam in Paradise Lost, immediately becomes enamored with Eve and seemingly desires intimate unity, later admitting, quote, I now see bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, myself, close quote. Milton's version not only aligns closely with the biblical account, but also elaborates it slightly by presenting Adam's visual perspective. Blackwood Stevens similarly portrays this Adamic passion and extends it. After Katya is alone in the wilderness for the first time, and vulnerable, Stephen seizes her in a frenzy of intimacy, quote, the next instant he held her smothering, uh, smothered in his arms, his face buried in the scented hair about her neck. There was an unbelievable time of forgetfulness in which touch, perfume, and a healing power that emanated from her blessed the depths of his soul with a peace that calmed all pain, stilled all tumult, tumult 
a moment in which time itself for once stopped its, its remorseless journey and the very processes of time, of sorry, of life stood still to watch. Leading up to this emotional ejaculation, Stephen has only gazed at Katya from afar, never able to meet her in person. This chance meeting, therefore, constitutes the first time they physically encounter one another. And Stephen exhibits Ambrosio-like behavior from Matthew Lewis's Gothic novel, The Monk, A Romance. Teeming with lust, Ambrosio sneaks into Antonia's bedchamber, where he discovers her asleep on her bed. Quote, he remained for some moments devouring those charms with his eyes, which soon were to be subjected to his ill-regulated passions. Her mouth half open seemed to solicit a kiss. He bent over her, he joined his lips to hers and drew in the fragrance of her, of her breath with rapture. This momentary pleasure increased his longing for still greater. His desires were raised to that frantic height by which brutes are agitated. He resolved not to delay for one instant longer the accomplishment of his wishes and hastily proceeded to tear off those garments which impeded the gratification of his lust." Close quote. Like the violating Ambrosio, Stephen discharges ravishing extremity, behaving as if he and Katy exist on sexually intimate terms. Blackwood presents Stephen in a type of lustful frenzy, finally releasing constrained passions with which he had been battling since having first discovered Katya. Though the narrator never explicitly states whether or not they copulate, Katya's description suggests some, some type of sexual interaction. Quote, she stood there, her, her soft eyes puzzled and surprised, looking hard at him, panting a little, her breast heaving, close quote. Katya is clearly aroused, she remains fixated on Stephen and finds herself out of breath. Blackwood entertains the thought of sexual intimacy primarily to demonstrate Stephen's intimacy with Katya vis-a-vis -vis Adam's knowing Eve. Undoubtedly, Blackwood achieves this aim because especially at this juncture in the narrative, the visceral connection between Stephen and Katya that suggests and later substantiates an, analog an analogous nexus with the biblical depiction of Adam and inevitably, his catastrophic fall. Blackwood's biblical scaffolding in the troubled space of the Lost Valley aids in excavation of a submerged human anxiety of original sin. Dread caused by original sin could lie at the cultural heart of Western civilization's anthropocentric approach to interfering with and dominating the post-lapsarian landscape. Contrasting the city of God with the city of man, Augustine referred to human, humankind's post-lapsarian mentality as libido dominandi, or a desire to dominate the world. But also referring to one's sex drive, libido could refer to sexual dominance in Blackwood's narrative in an effort to connect male domination of the female sexual object and her virgin landscape to the peril of inherited mortality. Though Blackwood never subscribed to any religious creed or dogma over the years, he knit a spiritual tapestry thread by thread, replacing and supplementing his faith as he went along. Nature, that is, the natural landscape, occupied much of that spiritual space. But along with a focus on the natural landscape in Blackwood's fiction, something else seems to surface from within that space. Blackwood reflects his view of the terrestrial world by infusing elements of the, of the celestial into the fictional settings. The Lost Valley depicts this type of setting when, when Dr. Stephen Winters uncovers a characteristic of nature he had never experienced. Whizzing and fluttering around him, the trees of the eponymous valley make themselves known. Quote, from the whole surface of the woods rose a single murmur, like the whirring of voices heard in a dream, he thought the individual purring of trees was merged, close quote. The forest erupts into what Stephen describes as a cacophony of murmuring, whirring voices and purring. What is striking here embodies the notion that trees are audible. Blackwood revisits the subject in his story, Pines, but he rationally attributes that oral source to the wind. In the Lost Valley, however, trees actually perform their anthropomorphic function unaided by rational phenomena. Without, an, without any rational explanation throughout the entire narrative, 
the Lost Valley pivots on uh, Svetan Todorov's concept of the fantastic marvelous and does so to tether the mystical phenomenon associated with a natural uh, slash unnatural setting to authenticity. What transpires is not a figment of the protagonist's imagination. It really is happening. Trees are audible because they possess emotions. They move because they are alive. This alternative reality facilitates the emergence of Blackwood's own interpretation of the natural landscape throughout his fiction. The concept of the natural unnatural setting uh, resurfaces elsewhere in Blackwood's over. Toward the end of the 19th century, unexpected physical movement among plant species became a known topic of scientific investigation. Following such publications in 1875 as on the movements and habits of climbing plants and insect, insectivorous plants, Charles Darwin presents theories on plant mobility in The Power of Movement in Plants, published in 1880, in which he concludes that plants react to external sources, namely the sun, and exhibit movement for survival. Demonstrated in such literary examples as Phil Robinson's The Man-Eating Tree, H.G. Wells' The Flowering of the Strange Orchid, and Fred M. White's The Purple Terror, late 19th century fiction considers locomotion within Regnum Erba, dealing with sentient and or mobile plant species. Though surfacing almost a decade later, Blackwood's fiction too seemingly, replica seemingly replicates this literary botanical trend. The Transfer, published in 1911, demonstrates a natural, unnatural landscape through the perspective of Miss Gould, the protagonist, governess for the Freen family, and would-be professional clairvoyant. The story's plot hinges upon events connected to a prohibited portion of the family's garden, referred to as, quote, the forbidden corner. Notwithstanding Gould's ability to sense the not notorious patch, it bears a peculiar connection to the family heir under her care, Jamie. On several occasions, for instance, he heard it crying and swore that the spot shook its surface while he watched it. Jamie is the main witness to the garden's physical activity, but because of Gould's age, position, and confidence within the Freen family, she occupies the position of credibility in the story. Her conveying Jamie's experiences testifies to the ominous garden's anthropomorphic qualities. The garden's strange characteristics, mirroring those of the trees in the Lost Valley, avoid rational explanation and become grafted into the narrative's fantastically marvelous re reality. But unlike the Lost Valley, the supernatural garden patch bears deeper anthropomorphic qualities. Blackwood's hybrid natural-unnatural setting wields the ability to cry and react to human interaction. And this evolving presentation of the troubled space establishes a new level of consciousness inherent in Blackwood's supernatural narrative settings. Though the non-human atmosphere takes, an, takes on otherworldly characteristics in Blackwood's tales, nothing depicts a supernatural setting as explicitly as the one in this story, The Transfer. The story's emphasis on the diabolical garden patch directs attention to the qualities that separate it from other entities, human and non-human, in the plot. Even though Gould represents the source of information in the narrative, Jamie constitutes the point of contact with the ostensibly nefarious portion of the garden. After experiencing the unknown life force in the ground by way of its sounds and movement, Jamie, quote, secretly gave it food in the form of birds or mice or rabbits he found dead upon his wanderings, close quote. Not only is he aware of the garden's unique features, but Jamie also understands that the non-human entity, whatever it may be, experiences hunger and yearns for something to satiate its appetite. Like Victor Frankenstein's monstrous creation, this sentient patch of ground has a motive of its own. Darwin's insectivorous plants primarily examines the carnivorous plant species Drosera rotundifolia, or the common sundew, and discovered that it, along with other carnivorous plants, digests its, pl its prey using a similar process to animals and humans. Though Blackwood never explains the digestive process of the garden patch, 
Jamie slakes its hunger by fetching it prey. Jamie's connection to this non-human being becomes substantial through highlighting the conscious condition of the latter. Nobody besides Jamie understands the strange phenomena in the garden, but the transfer becomes a troubled space in which the fantastic marvelous inverts logic through the presentation of an alternative understanding of the, super, of the supernatural landscape presented as reality, where the physical setting is consciously alive, experiences hunger and must eat to survive. Dead animals, however, are not the only prey that this garden consumes. Upon, arri upon arrival of the reprehensible Uncle Frank, known for his scheming and manipulation of innocent people, the garden patch exhibits behavior that supersedes any taking place earlier in the plot. Jamie, standing on one side of the garden patch, maintains his distance from Uncle Frank, who approaches him from the opposite side. Meanwhile, the patch mysteriously pulls Uncle Frank directly toward it. Whether or not the patch reacts to protect Jamie remains unclear. What is clear nonetheless is that it caught Uncle Frank somehow and caused him to fall face forward onto its surface. Such words as destruction and destroyed describe Uncle Frank's final condition after his fall. But was his destruction due to physical collapse? The text fails to say explicitly, yet offers a clue as to the true nature of the experience. After Uncle Frank's fall, Gould hears a gulp that sounded deep and muffled as it dipped away into the earth. Darwin's study of the digestive process of carnivorous plants highlights the latter's ability to break down organic material by subsuming its nutrients through physical contact that slowly destroys the digested material. The digestive process in the transfer ostensibly occurs through this same contact between Uncle Frank and the garden patch. Whereas Uncle Frank never recovers, having, quote, dropped suddenly from life, quote, and, uh, end quote, the garden patch flourishes. Unlike what exists in Blackwood's The Lost Valley, the physical setting in the transfer consumes human beings. Although he toys with this idea in the story, The Man Whom the Trees Loved, which was published in 1912, Blackwood never places such a robust emphasis as he does in the transfer on the ability of a non-human entity to devour and digest a living person. This focus on the natural setting and appetite affixes a palpable level of consciousness to Blackwood's supernaturally troubled spaces. In the light of eating, falling, and dying within a troubled space, let alone a garden, these supernatural landscapes conjure up Christian imagery of Earth's first ecological locus. Familiar to Blackwood through his strict Christian upbringing, Eden constitutes the rudimentary element of the hybridized landscape where the natural setting merges with unnatural characteristics, rendering it troubled. This biblically charged Edenic landscape would primarily stimulate the physical settings in Blackwood's work between 1907 in 1914. Depictions of the Garden of Eden enjoy a rich history within Occidental literature and this literary and a literary Gothic mode. Reaching as far back as the second chapter in Genesis, the Edenic landscape has influenced various texts over time. From the ancient Holy Wood in Dante Alighieri's Divina Commedia, to the Arcadian landscape in Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen, to John Milton's Paradise Lost. The Edenic setting, or Eden itself in the case of Milton's work, occupies a familiar place in Occidental li uh, literature. In Shelley's uh, canonical Gothic novel, Frankenstein's creature was familiar with Milton's work, often referring to it because he felt a simultaneous connection to Adam and Satan. Also referring to Paradise Lost and Frankenstein, Nathaniel Hawthorne furthers the literary Gothic's relationship with Christian iconography when he incorporated the Edenic setting into Rappuccini's Daughter, published in 1844, a short story about a Frankensteinian scientist, Dr. Giacomo Rappuccini, and his daughter Beatrice, a beautiful yet lethally poisonous young woman who caused her lover's death. Though these narratives are not the only renditions of the Edenic setting in Occidental storytelling or Gothic fiction or supernatural horror narratives, they constitute popular examples in literature that incorporate Christian iconography 
allude to the Adenic landscape and occupy a literary platform from which they influence subsequent narratives. This Christian architecture permeates the settings in Blackwood's fiction. When the protagonists experience and interpret their respective settings, the mise-en-scene reflects an atmosphere found in the first two chapters of Genesis. Mirroring the biblical setting during the creation, the garden in the Lost Valley consists of lush vegetation, quote, grass, wild lilac bushes, willows, pines, beaches, and flowers, close quote. Blackwood typically weaves a vivid tapestry when illustrating his natural landscapes, but up until Stephen arrives in the titular valley, isolated from civilization, the narrator had never described the prior setting with as much variety and color as he does this one. Stephen enters a new world of beauty. Visual and sensory attributes, nevertheless, are not the only facets of this mysteriously novel landscape. The setting provides Stephen an anchorage in which to seek shelter from the maelstrom ravaging his conscience. The contrast is noticeable, quote, never, never before had he experienced anything approaching the wonder and completeness of it. It was a peace unchangeable, what some have called perhaps the peace of God, close quote. Unique to Stephen, this newfound place of peace and wonder also bears a quality of that harmony that is typically unfound in the real world. Any physical setting fostering the aforementioned peace of God would have existed in either a pre-lapsarian world, Eden, or would exist in a post-Perusian state, a celestial earth. Augustine no notes that humans only, quote, live in peace, that is heavenly peace found in the city of God. For Blackwood, his natural landscape refers to and bears these paradisiacal qualities. And his grammatically mechanical use of the M dash places emphasis on the concept of godly peace, evidently inexistent outside the celestial zone. It is, with, it is within this otherworldly landscape where Blackwood again connects his troubled space to the Garden of Eden. Blackwood is explicit about the supernatural setting to which he refers. When the governess describes the narrative setting in the transfer, she leaves no ambiguity when she describes it as a, quote, big garden with wonderful flowers. What I find captivating here is the scale of the garden's size in the story. Gould describes the garden as if it were the only world she ever knew. The interpretation is fitting because the epicenter of the story's action and climax exists at the heart of this lush space. Blackwood emphasizes the paradisiacal nature of this garden, but this time not through mere mechanics or syntax. According to Jack Sullivan, Blackwood prefers to quote, suggest rather than define, close quote, which is what he seemingly does here. The garden admits Edenic characteristics, not through narrative explication, but through character action. Only three characters can experience the full spectrum of the garden, Jamie, Gould, and Uncle Frank. David Punter and S.T. Yoshi highlight the interpersonal triangles in Blackwood's fiction, characteristically among two males and a female. This case seemingly follows suit in a biblical way because these characters allude to the trio of the fall, Adam, Eve, and Satan. In the transfer, Jamie is, per, is a perceptive youth who is innocent and dependent on his father. His sole actions in the narrative occur within the garden he tends. Gould is a clairvoyant young woman who shares Jamie's innocence in the narrative and whose main actions likewise remain confined within the garden. Uncle Frank, on the other hand, is described as a supernaturally antagonistic force who, quote, vampires the vitality of others and tempts his victims with his Eastern eyes. When these characteristics are compared to those of Adam, Eve, and Satan, they bear striking similarities. Like Jamie and Gould, Adam and Eve are innocent and childlike, restricted to Eden until after the fall. Uncle Frank reflects the image and actions of Satan. He is described as having a diabolically white face, a dangerously persuasive demeanor, and lives off the bodies and lives of others, as if he is missing something himself. Blackwood ostensibly patterns his three characters after their biblical counterparts to emphasize the setting in which the latter originally confronted one another, Eden. <laughs> 
A darker, uh, excuse me, a darker reflection of Eden, moreover, surfaces in Blackwood's uh, short story called The Damned, when the protagonist, Bill, wanders through the spacious grounds of a deceased evangelical pastor. Bill notices that the beautiful garden that he observes harbors a dark secret that taints its image with evil. Quote, for I saw as with the eyes of a child what I can only call a goblin garden. House, grounds, trees, and flowers belonged to a goblin world. The goblin touch lay plainly everywhere. What ought to have been fairy, joyful, natural, was instead uncomely to the verge of the, cro of the grotesque. Spontaneous expression was arrested. My mind perceived a goblin garden and was caught in it. The place grimaced at me. Close quote. Like, Franken like Frankenstein's experiment, the evangelical pastor's garden creation had gone terribly wrong. And Blackwood's protagonist almost recoils at the sight of such a hideous creation, uh, akin to Victor's fright at the sight of his own uh, finished monstrous product. Blackwood's goblin garden owes its ugliness to the trapped souls it imprisons. Souls who have been damned by the evangelical patriarch of the property. Like Victor's creature, these souls must suffer the torment of rejection and manifest their sorrows through revenge. They endlessly contaminate the pastor's precious garden with evil. This Edenic garden in The Damned is a hybrid, a, a supernatural amalgamation of beauty and evil, much like Eden after the fall of Adam and Eve, a paradise of purity yet stained by sin. The Damned marshals its troubled space with its scenes of trepidation on this upwelling of anxiety about original sin. Blackwood's fictional narratives constitute an intersection of life and landscape on a higher supernatural plane where his interpretation of the natural environment operates. Blackwood's understanding of the natural environment developed throughout his life and found profound expression in his writings, mainly his short story, excuse me, mainly his short stories. Nature exemplified a higher sense of life in Blackwood's fictional worlds. As an author, Blackwood sculpts settings that defy common expectations and his troubled landscapes are a hybridized assortment of the natural and unnatural. These troubled spaces operate with their own set of rules that fail to adhere to those in the quotidian world. The troubled space becomes a space which Todorov's concept of the fantastic marvelous, operating under the veil of the Gothic aesthetic, functions as the vehicle through which Blackwood presents a nuanced understanding of the natural environment. This unconventional concept ostensibly reaches its apex in moments where the physical setting experiences such inexplicable anthropomorphic qualities as hunger and sensual satisfaction, caused not by ins insignificant offerings, but by the literal fall and death of a human character. These concepts of falling and dying within a garden space are undeniably recognizable in a biblical context, something with which Blackwood was intimately familiar. Christian iconography emerges when Blackwood connects his troubled spaces to Eden, and he reinforces this concept through specific characters who must demonstrate spiritual influence to interact with the Edenic setting and who strikingly resemble those characters found in the original garden of the Old Testament. What remains fascinating about Blackwood is that his spiritual path always uh, constituted learning new concepts and synthesizing them with what he found already familiar. Perhaps Sullivan is correct to call Blackwood didactic, since the latter's fiction ostensibly serves as the vehicle in which he delivers his synthesized spiritual knowledge. In an increasingly modernizing industrial society, Blackwood seemingly felt the weight of responsibility, almost like the biblical prophets, to warn his generation against forsaking the requisite spirituality for, for re-entry into the bliss of a once savored Edenic paradise. Troubled spaces also inhabit such horror classics as Universal's Dracula, Frankenstein, The Wolfman, and Creature from the Black Lagoon. These films resurface to convey some more than others, their interpretation 
of familiar supernatural horror stories and or themes. One monster from Universal's pantheon, however, may have accomplished more than merely frighten its audience. Produced during the 1950s, Jack Arnold's Creature from the Black Lagoon suggests a novel way to interpret the horror narrative. Current scholarly discourse highlights the adhesion of American horror films of the 1950s to their contemporary political climate. The decade following the Second World War experienced a growing polarization of political influence between the two dominant superpowers in the world, the United States and the Soviet Union. As both nations rivaled one another in such spheres as exploration, technology, and militarization, tensions heightened and led to fears of another catastrophic war, this time involving the use of multiple atomic bombs. Andrew Tudor maintains that American horror films during this decade evince plots that hinge on the perils of mad science and atomic energy. David Punter and Glennis Byron also endorse this position by noting how these films, quote, encode arguments about the Cold War, close quote, relating to fears of Soviet invasion and communism. Black Lagoon, however, follows a different formula. Invasion in this film derives from an environmental rather than political mold. Instead of implicitly propagating Soviet aggression paranoia, inherent in such other films of the area as Radar Men from the Moon, invaders from Mars, and so forth, Black Lagoon introduces a story set in a politically tranquil world with characters who, representing civilization, constitute an invasive force res responsible for damaging the physical environment and experiencing the subsequent horror of the landscape's monstrous reaction. Set in the far reaches of the Amazonian rainforest, Black Lagoon's story explicitly illuminates the notion of human invasion and danger to the natural environment. In an attempt to subdue and capture the epitomous creature, doctors David Reed and Mark Williams urge Captain Lucas to concoct a chemical compound called rhodonone to poison all marine life in the lagoon with the hope of affecting the monster. Without hesitation, the group agrees to use the toxic substance, which causes all fish in the lagoon to float lifelessly at the surface. Injecting unnatural chemicals into the monster's natural environment alters the state of that setting and disturbs every living organism within its immediate area. The film's titular creature reacts to these environmental threats by attacking the human perpetrators and causing them to flee for their lives. Black Lagoon's presentation of human recklessness uh, through an indiscriminately destructive chemical agent anticipated Rachel Carson's seminal environmental text, Silent Spring published in 1962. By utilizing her paradigmatic demonstration of collateral damage to the environment. In the volume's narrative portion titled A Fable for Tomorrow, Carson presents a fictional story of a small American town that experiences catastrophic change by the destructive effects of the chemical pesticide DDT. The anthropogenic disaster, what she refers to as, quote, the evil spell, close quote, silences all non-human life within and around the town. Like the devastated organisms in Silent Spring, those in the Black Lagoon encounter chemical poisons and suffer death as a result of human irresponsibility and domination. In short, Creature from the Black Lagoon conveys an environmental discourse that evinces a human-centered relationship between humanity and the physical environment. This cinematic production explores how scientists approach the natural landscape with a blatant disregard for anthropogenic damage. This mistreatment of the biosphere thus renders the physical setting a victim of anthropocentrism. And the environmental monstrosity in this film constitutes a collective non-human reaction to this detrimental mindset while simultaneously il illuminating its disastrous effects. This brief examination highlights the possibility of adding an environmental lens to the limited scope through which current scholars read this period of American horror cinema. Rather than solely alluding to the dangers of an impending Soviet invasion, Black Lagoon raises an environmental awareness to universal anthropocentrism that permeates every society, leading to deleterious consequences to the natural environment that anticipate Carson's movement inaugurating Silent Spring in the years that followed. Animated films also depict human interaction with, with these troubled spaces. After announcing retirement in 2013, Japanese animator Hayao Miyazaki, 
famous for such films as Castle in the Sky, My Neighbor Totoro, and the Oscar-winning Spirited Away, returned to the film industry by releasing a subsequent animated feature in 2018 titled Boro the Caterpillar. This film's nature-based theme plays a significant role in Miyazaki's cinematic homecoming, considering its anticipated nod back to an earlier production, Princess Mononoke. Celebrating its 20th century in 2017, Mononoke, the story of a feral girl and a prince who battle an evil curse, remains one of Miyazaki's most popular works. Yet notwithstanding its overall positive reputation, scholars continue to overlook this film. What separates Mononoke is its treatment and representation of the natural world. Specifically, the film highlights and employs animals as carriers and harbingers of an ancient curse draped in the vestige, vestiges of religious antiquity. And in so doing, Mononoke presents troubled spaces and their effects on the humans who attempt to dominate their physical environments. Mononoke wastes no time in revealing his troubled predisposition. Commencing in medias res, the opening scene transports the audience into the midst of a conflict between a colossal boar demon, Nago, and humans of the Amishi tribe. Nago's rampage causes the re-emergence of a curse that has haunted Mononoke's world for millennia. Visitations of the past upon the present signal a traditional function in Gothic fiction. As Gerald E. Hogle illustrates, inherent in the Gothic mode, there exists a, quote, backward leaning tendency that confronts modernity's progressive motions with the Gothic's retrogressive propensity typically emerging in two forms, the, antiqu the antiquated setting and the monstrous figure, close quote. The Gothic setting presents itself as a troubled site that evinces ties to the past and typically conceals a secret, whereas the monstrous entity constitutes an invasive force with some connection to that setting and its secret. Mononoke implements these Gothic ingredients by grounding its narrative in a primitive wilderness and presenting gigantic animal gods or demons which transmit an inexistent, sorry, transmit an existent secret or curse. In the narrative's opening scenes, this curse infects Ashitaka, the protagonist and last prince of the Amishi people, when he confronts and destroys Nago. Now physically bearing the scourge on his body, Ashitaka understands that he must seek those same animalistic monsters, not only to learn more about the curse itself, but also to save himself and the rest of humankind from its doom. Emerging in such Gothic narratives as Shelley's Frankenstein and Bram Stoker's Dracula, monsters maintain commonplace appearances in canonical Gothic texts and supernatural horror narratives. Focusing on monsters in the Gothic, David Punter and Glennis Byron uh, etymologically dissect the term monster and trace its roots to a Latin blend of monstrare and monere, which mean uh, respectively to, to demonstrate and to warm. Identifying the monster's visceral function as an agent of revelation and or warning. In this vein, Mononoke employs its animalistic monsters, specifically the boar demons, Nago and Okoto, as oracular messengers and harbingers of an ancient curse. Both demons are responsible for transmitting uh, the scourge to Ashitaka and his female companion, Sun. By transferring this damning curse, bestial monsters in Mon Mononoke warn Ashitaka and Sun about human uh, mortality, and the companionship's only opportunity to survive lies in another monstrous animal god, which can purge the curse's stain literally and metaphorically. Mononoke's narrative amalgamation of gods, devils, damning curses, mortality, and salvation identifies an intertextual mooring to the biblical count of the creation. Although Miyazaki originally composed Mononoke in his native country, Japan, with its predominantly Shinto and Buddhist population, presenting Western traditions uh, for a Japanese audience is not unfamiliar in animation and embodies its own subcategory within the Japanese fantasy genre. Mononoke firmly resides within the subcategory, within this subcategory, and demonstrates intertextuality with the Bible by portraying a protagonist male and female character as figures of Adam and Eve. The narrative clarifies this point when both Ashitaka and San receive their mortal curse from devils. Lucifer, the, not the notorious devil in the biblical account, tempts Adam and Eve to bring about, to bring about their spiritual and physical demise. <clears throat> 
But the curse is not the only strand of biblical intertextuality in Mononoke. The secluded inner forest where the great tree spirit, a monstrous elk god, resides, mirrors the biblical description of Eden's garden. While the Old Testament describes a singular tree of life standing in the midst of, a gar uh, of Eden and surrounded by various waters, the mise-en-scene comprising Mononoke's inner forest uh, consists of a majestic tree upon a vibrantly colored green isle, sorry, a green island surrounded by crystalline water. Owing to its vivid colors, reverent atmosphere and the absence of civilization, this natural landscape demonstrates a unique physical setting in the film. When juxtaposed with all other scenes dominated by images of darkness, war, industrial waste, this forested background of tranquility, spirituality, and purity presents a singular locus of sanctity. These seemingly consecrated characteristics, moreover, encourage investigation of the site's native animal. The most powerful of all animal gods, the great forest spirit, invokes a deeper sense of biblical borrowing through his messianic demeanor. On one occasion, he walks atop the water, compar comparably to Christ's feet in the New Testament. When Ashitaka suffers a bullet wound and loses a dangerous amount of blood, the animal spirit revives him from a death-like sleep in a manner reminiscent of Christ raising Lazarus from the dead. By enacting biblical miracles and serving as Ashitaka and Son's source of life after death, this supreme animal god functions as a living omen of humanity's mortality and subsequent salvation. Mononoke altogether portrays this biblical intertextuality through messianic miracles and in a Edenic setting as a way to moor the functionality of its troubled space to a recognizably ancient register. That Mononoke emphasizes a profusion of biblical intertextuality also helps explain why the film's animals stir feelings of anxiety among its human characters. In the city of God, Augustine underlines Adam and Eve's curse, what he terms original sin, as the great sin that renders humanity subject to death's reign. Augustine further identifies a universal feeling of apprehension among human beings regarding mortality because they resent what has been arbitrarily imposed upon them. This suffering for an ancestor's sins is not unusual for super supernatural horror narratives. Horace Walpole, the progenitor of Gothic fiction, constructed his inaugural Gothic story, The Castle of Otranto, with this supernatural framework in mind. In the preface to his first edition, Walpole explains that the moral uh, of his, um, excuse me, the moral of his narrative constitutes how sins of the father are visited on their children. Because it highlights suffering for the sinful deeds of humanity's first parents, original sin serves as a kind of Walpolean motif in Mononoke. Ashitaka and son share in the struggle to hope, uh, sorry, to cope with an inherited fate. And Miyazaki's film accentuates the biblical conception of original sin by channeling it through animals in a troubled space, which manifests and transfer the debilitating curse to human characters. Princess Mononoke utilizes animals as vehicles through which its supernatural features present themselves throughout the film. Beasts operate within a primitive wilderness and figuratively exhume a biblical curse that condemns the human protagonist, Ashitaka, and his female companion, San, to their deaths. Together they confront an inherent uh, and inherent anxiety, sorry, together, together they confront an inherent anxiety related to mortality and obtain salvation through another animal, a messianic elk god, which represents the biblical Christ. Mononoke explain, employs, Mononoke employs biblical intertextuality to help emphasize universal anxiety about mortality. And this brief examination of Miyazaki's film presents a perspective lens uh, through which critics can further interpret this film's contents and compare them to other features in Miyazaki's oeuvre. By altogether examining these elements of supernatural horror in an animated film like Mononoke, Scholars can include a new visual genre to interrogate the ambivalent relationship between humanity and the physical environment, a move that could further strengthen supernatural horror narratives as an interpretive foundation upon which stands a profound environmental dialectic. In conclusion, this Occidental anxiety draped around humanity's attempted domination of the natural world 
supernatural horror narratives could supernatural horror narratives could be hinting at a likely root of anthropocentrism in the West. With all the current pandemic related disruptions caused by the global outbreak of COVID-19, humanity is reminded of its vulnerability and mortality. An agent of the physical environment, a virus, like the various monsters in the aforementioned stories, horror films, and animated work, can create troubled spaces for human hosts. Perhaps this pandemic is a haunting reminder that the entire planet may be one troubled space. Retrospectively, viewing cultural artifacts, namely literary narratives, in the light of this pandemic could help uncover how cultural history has engaged with anthrop anthropocentric views of the natural environment. Could a microscopic virus, such as the one which causes COVID-19, win the respect of a helpless humanity for the natural environment? For me, it did not take a life-threatening pandemic, a, a life-threatening pandemic to win my respect. That day at the beach many years ago, I learned an important lesson. Alone and near a natural source of danger, I realized that I was never in control and that whatever it was fluttering past me, be it a shark, a stingray, whatever, and respect because the world does not merely belong to a fallen humankind. It belongs to all other non-human entities as well. Rather than regaining Eden per se, humanity should work to reflect that garden's beauty and magnificence, not by dominating the existing natural world, but by protecting and preserving what remains of it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Christopher Scott, for this enlightening talk. When we planned this web conference, myself, Dr. Neeta Chakravarti, and Dr. Pratima Das, conveners of this conference, and uh, Dr. Prat Deepa Mishra, the organizing secretary, then Dr. Nilakshi Roy and Dr. Dinesh Kumar, senior academicians, who are part of the organizing team of this conference, we desired to generate discourses that would arouse the interest of young researchers who are with us today. Your academic discourse on the troubled spaces has been captivating and is sure to ignite many research ideas in their minds. We, the organizers, are grateful to you for having spared your valuable time. Thank you once again. Thank you. It was a pleasure. I'm, I'm happy to be with you today. Are there any questions, Sham, uh, Ashwati, anyone who is participating, if there are any questions? Devi Prasad, are there questions? Yeah, there are some. There right are some... now, no questions, only feedbacks are coming. So shall we ask them to ask questions? Nita? Yeah, uh, are there any questions? You all are requested to share in the chat if there are any questions. There is an observation. Uh, of a student who has said that, uh, you know, in, it's not a question, but it's an observation. Uh, in fact, a PG student who has said that uh, she appreciates the work of uh, uh, Miyazaki in the presentation. That is what she said. There is a question, uh, Devi Prasad, is from Meera Kasiraman. Nita, see the chat, there is a question. Devi Prasad asked two questions. Uh, Akshat Shukla and Meera Kasiraman. Yeah, Meera Kasiraman asks a question. Could you recommend a critical theory, a conceptual framework or tool that discusses troubled spaces in general, not particularly Gothic, like Foucauldian heterotopias, for instance? Could you repeat part of that question? It was was that did you say in light of gender? I I, I didn't I didn't. Hear uh, that. I'll repeat my question. Uh, you. Could you recommend a critical theory, a conceptual framework or tool that discusses troubled spaces in general, 
not particularly gothic, like Foucauldian heterotopias, for instance. Hmm. You can see the question in the chat box, Christopher, in case you Oh, I can. I can. Okay. Um, let me see if I can access the chat. It, it's okay. So I can answer the question. Um, in light of my experience with, with theory in my research, uh, particularly, I would, what I could recommend would be eco-criticism. Eco-criticism as a critical theory or as a literary theory uh, definitely highlights uh, the, the, I guess the intersection of human and non-human interaction in texts. And more often than not, when you use that lens to, uh, to observe such narratives as, I mean, not only the ones that I talked about, but even other narratives, more often than not, we see very problematic or troubled spaces uh, surrounding these, these, um, these physical environments in these narratives. Uh, so I would highly recommend uh, starting with Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, uh, especially the, uh, the narrative, uh, A Fable for Tomorrow, which, I mean, she's referred to as, as almost the, the mother of eco-criticism. Uh, so I would start there, but uh, eco-criticism just in general is, I, is, is focused on the physical environment as almost this troubled space because of anthropocentrism um, or you know, human uh, negligence, human ignorance, human dominance, et cetera, et cetera. More questions in the chat box. Yeah. yeah, there is another question from Dr. Deepa Mishra. What is the future of apocalyptic narrative? How do we approach a text like The Last Man in the context of the current pandemic? Hmm. That's a good question. What is the future of apocalyptic narrative? How do we approach a text like the last man in the context of the current pandemic? I, that's, that question is so fascinating because <laughs> in highlighting the last man, we can circle back and, and, and go to the, you know, Christianity's first man, right? In looking at these anxieties, these inherent anxieties. Now, of course, uh, Christianity would be quite limited to a certain uh, number of, of the world population. However, cultures, uh, cultures throughout the world uh, could be harboring some type of anxiety or, um, you know, some type of anxiety related to mortality. It doesn't have to be um, of a Christian narrative, but looking at what that is and, and highlight, looking at apocalyptic uh, uh, narratives, they readily remind us of mortality. And I think The Last Man, just, just that title alone is evident of that, right? So what, you know, moving forward in looking at COVID-19, I think COVID-19 has ultimately demonstrated uh, to humanity our vulnerability, even in the 21st century, even in the year 2020, right? Um, where we think as we progress with technologies, and uh, you know, you know the 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 incessant uh, march of time, right? Perhaps that's our, our hubris, is we feel like we we control more, we dominate more of what is essentially always has been a troubled space, right? So I think uh, to answer this question, I hope I'm answering the question fully. Um, yeah, where where do we go from there? Where does apocalyptic fiction go from there? And I think more and more they're going to show how feeble humans are in this troubled space or how vulnerable we are and how subject we are to our own mortality. There is another question for you, Dr. Christopher. Why is the supernatural mostly associated with the evil in our popular cinema and literature when it could be as much about the good as the evil? So that's another another very good question. Um, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. Um, unfortunately, when when you uh, in in my research, it's quite uh, tunnel vision, right? <laughs> in supernatural horror narratives, uh, the the supernatural uh, tends to take on a negative uh, aura. 
but uh, in, in other genres or other literary modes, such as you know magical, I mean magical liter magical realism comes to mind. So the supernatural isn't always negative. I think the negative in my in my case or what I'm finding in my research, the negativity is the tool being used. Uh, the supernatural is 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 being um, is is being portrayed as something negative. As a, as a means to an end, and so in this case, what I just what I discussed in my talk is is allowing uh, humanity or human characters to remember certain things, or allowing these haunting uh, truths uh, to remain with us, so that we don't forget about them. And in, in this case, uh, what we dis what we discussed uh, during this um, during this talk, mortality, original sin, right, and um, and, uh, and, and, and humanity is grappling with that reality. Yeah, there is another question, I think it's from some student. Don't you think that we can include T.S. Eliot's wasteland into this category of, about the degradation in the society? Absolutely. Absolutely, and, and T.S. Eliot's Wasteland it would, it would be another example of a troubled space. Um, and, and maybe for, for different reasons or maybe even for the same reason, right? Maybe more, maybe this, that, that space is, is highly troubled because of this, this haunting or this looming uh, reality that is mortality brought on by uh, the, the First World War, you know, formerly called the Great War. Um, and a catastrophic, catastrophic event in, in, in history at that time uh, brought a lot of people to realize that, uh, that humanity is not as immortal as maybe it once thought, right? So yeah, absolutely. I, I would see Eliot's Wasteland, um, you know, fitting that mold. Okay, there's another question. Do you think that the lack of empathy towards animals shown in Lord of Flies by William Golding contributed towards the decline of humanity in the text? Could you repeat the question one more time, please? Sorry. It says, do you think that the lack of empathy towards animals shown in Lord of Flies by William Golding contributed towards the decline of humanity in the text? Another good question. Um, I mean, it depends. I mean, it depends a lot on how you analyze those scenes with the with the pig's head, right? And and the juxtaposition of the pig's head on with with um, with other features in that text. So looking at uh, perhaps a, a Christ figure that's always portrayed in uh, in in the in uh, Lord of the Flies. So we have kind of a juxtaposition of evil and, and good or, or damnation and salvation. So lumping animals into that, uh, is that the cause? That's a really good question. Uh, perhaps, perhaps I would say if, if that's deliberate and, you know, perhaps Golding is showing just kind of this, uh, this discrediting of, of, of animal value you know, in turn, you know, um, reflects our own evil or the evil within us, right? So I'm looking at that connection with the, with the boars at the pig's head or the boar's head uh, with evil in that, uh, in that instance in the story. So yeah, it very well could be. It, it just depends on, on deep analysis of that scene and, and synthesizing that with, with maybe what, what other uh, scholars um, have noted about that. Okay, the next question says, why do we have human nature in supernatural novel? Is there any other option? Why do we have supernatural nature in... in um, why do we have human nature in supernatural novels? Is there any other option? Of course, yes, of course, there are other options. Um, one point, uh, a big part of my research looks at rhetoric and uh, I teach rhetoric and I research rhetoric and rhetorical criticism. And anything having to do with rhetoric is looking at deliberate choices that writers, authors, 
uh, speakers make. I would see to answer this question or to, to address this question, I would see again, supernatural as being, or in this case, supernatural horror as being a tool, as being the means to a rhetorical end. So Blackwood or Miyazaki um, or uh, you know, Jack Arnold, you know, any of these creators of, of uh, if, you know, these films or these texts that have supernatural horror elements in them, there's a rhetorical choice being made or, or having been made. So yes, there are other choices that an author could use. Uh, I'm particularly interested in and fascinated by why they make these particular choices and how they go about presenting these choices in their text. So yes, of course, anything but supernatural, we can have the human nature uh, displayed otherwise. But what makes it unique in the supernatural horror uh, narrative? So that's what I'm trying to look at and what I can, what I can see uh, as the supernatural element being used as an instrument to show us maybe what's happening with human nature. Okay, there is a question by Sundari Johnson. How exactly can a parallel be drawn between the present coron coronavirus pandemic in the literary discourse you discussed and or in the Bible? Well, I, my, my quick answer would be mortality uh, and, and uh, a haunting reminder of mortality. So, my focus was, was mainly on an Occidental literary tra uh, tradition that informs these authors and, and informs uh, you know, cultural so you know, society writ large of this, uh, of this tradition, this inherited tradition or these vestiges of, uh, of, of biblical teachings of the creation, right? The fall, Adam and Eve, original sin that causes the fall. So, what comes out of that, uh, you know, the, the big uh, byproduct of that is mortality, according to the teachings, right? And the, of those inherited teachings. So I would say with COVID-19, the world has been brought to a standstill and has faced the haunting reminder of mortality. And so what I was hoping to do in this discourse is show that any time human characters, be it humanity, uh, you know, us uh, as a human family, try to dominate this physical environment, try to uh, demonstrate our human prowess. It comes back to haunt us, right? And, and COVID-19 is a perfect example of that, of showing how vulnerable we've, we really are and, and how we've always been, right? This space has never been tamed. The world has never been tamed and perhaps it can never be tamed. It is a troubled space and perhaps will always be a troubled space. And I think we need to come uh, to a, a recognition of that. Okay. The next question says, fairy tales, thinking of animations, Miyazaki, hide the element of the Gothic by making it seem entertaining and fabulous. But it seems the simmering violence of these grandmother tales are warning us about the primordial violence that construct our universe, patriarchy, misogyny, uh, ecological or spectacular physical violence. How do you look at the connection between fairy tales and violence? What are the lessons that women particularly derive from such tales? Yeah, that's another great question. Uh, fairy tales, I mean, fairy tales are famous for uh, their messages, right? Their morals that, uh, that they have, uh, you know, seemingly baked into them. Um, and they are didactic, they are overly didactic in nature. We get something from them. We're taught something uh, from them, from these morals that, that, are, that are being expressed. Um, Rounding it back to Miyazaki's films, or in this case, Mononoke in general, I find it interesting that uh, the female characters in this film are, are quite empowered uh, in, in the way that, I mean, Princess Mononoke is the main character, 
you know, one of the, one of the main characters, if not the main character. Um, the antagonist or the leader of, of, a, uh, of a human group who are warring with the animals is also a woman. She has taken in uh, uh, out, you know, outsiders, social outsiders who are women. Uh, these women are prostitute, former prostitutes, and uh, you know, outcasts from society. So we have females in these roles uh, where they occupy positions of power. Now, what does this mean? Why, why do, why could this be happening? Now, I think there's a universal quality that's being um, uh, perhaps portrayed here in that Adam and Eve were a unit. And if that, if that's the connection being made, definitely being made uh, by the discourse that I just shared, if they're a unit, they can rise as a unit. They can also fall as a unit. And so I think despite uh, where these women are in Mononoke in these positions of power, they are also vulnerable to the same, um, to the same evils or the same haunting reminders uh, that men are. Right? So they're not exempt from these things. And so I think there's almost a universal connection being made, um, whereas it's, yes, we have uh, you know, you know, female characters um, who are different in this, in this instant, but uh, they, are, they are the same as well because they're almost in the same predicament as uh, males when it comes to the physical environment and, and the troubled space, as it were. Okay, we come to the last question. Could we draw a parallel between George Orwell's coming up for air and the present scenario? I think it could work so as the narrative takes place in the time between the world wars where the characters wear masks and seek hideouts lest they be found. So they... Yeah, an, an, another great, uh, an, another great uh, insight in, into how we can maybe extend this discourse beyond these texts to another text. And Orwell is a great, um, he's, you know, that, that's another great point of contact. Um, absolutely, the connection with the mass. I mean, right now in the United States, we're seeing a, a surge or, or a resurgence of COVID-19 infections. And there's a lot of uh, discourse about whether go state governors should make face masks mandatory and there's a lot of pushback against that, you know, with, you know, with with a, a mandate like that infringing on people's personal rights and freedoms. Uh, but then there's this this looming kind of question about collective good, like what what is, uh, you know, what do we do about the collective good? What do we do when personal individual rights um, are now uh, affecting the collective uh, good or the collective health of a society? Uh, so the connections I think can definitely be made in terms of, uh, you know, masks, just masks as, as, a, as a point of uh, comparison, but even Orwell's 1984 in, in looking at totalitarianism and, and the effects of that on a society. And could a disaster such as uh, COVID-19 render us so vulnerable that we become um, almost susceptible to a type of totalitarianism, right? Or, uh, you know, a sacrificing of, uh, of certain things, whatever they may be, in order to have security again, or in order to be virus free or pandemic free, if that is in, in fact possible. And I think another place, and I'll just end on this, another place that I think it would be interesting is the, the idea of a vaccine. Now, when, when a vaccine comes out, eventually, we, we hope, right? Uh, the entity who controls that vaccine will, will have a lot of power, right? Because the demand for that vaccine will be astronomical. Uh, could, could that, could that, excuse me, sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I, I had a face, Facebook, or not Facebook, sorry, uh, FaceTime uh, communication came in. I hope you didn't hear that ring. Um, anyway, sorry, I was saying that uh, the entity that has uh, the vaccine, um, because of the demand, could that make us susceptible to a type of totalitarianism or some type of unfairness or unethical treatment? Because we're, we're, we want, we desire, we need this vaccine because it'll return us to quote unquote normalcy. Uh, 
right? So that, that connection could also be made. I'll end on that. Sorry, I, I was talking too much. <laughs> that was a wonderful session. I think it was very satisfying for all of us. Quite an enthralling and vibrating session. Thank, oh, thank you, Dr. Christopher. Oh, thank you so much. And again, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, this brings us to an end to day one of our two-day international webinar. I, with this, I, I declare that we uh, the day closed to uh, the session closed. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Goodbye. Goodbye.